Welcome. This is a Frisbee. The story goes that William Russell Frisbee had a bakery in Bridgeport, Connecticut, which is near Yale University, in the 1870s. It said he sold a lot of pies to students and they began using the empty tins to toss around for fun and called them Frisbees in his honor. Now it wasn't until 1958 that the Whammo Company began producing these now famous plastic discs. So what keeps a Frisbee aloft? There are two physics principles involved. One is the Bernoulli effect which explains why the slower moving air under the frisbee creates a region of higher pressure, thus creating lift. This principle helps to explain the lift that is generated by an airplane wing, and it is also used to advantage in a pitot tube, which is used to measure air flow speed. Now, because the net force on the frisbee is not directly in the center, it also needs gyroscopic stability or rotational stability. This depends in large part on the rotational moment of inertia. Now for a disc, the rotational moment of inertia is calculated as one-half the mass times the radius squared. However, for a ring of the same mass, the rotational moment of inertia is twice as high. You may have noticed in a frisbee that the rim feels relatively thicker, and the mass is distributed in order to take advantage of this effect. I'm Dr. Courtney. We're going to compute the total moment of inertia for the frisbee as the sum of the moments for a ring and a disc, each with half the mass of the total mass of the frisbee. We designate the moment of inertia with a capital I. Now the disc and the ring, this is important, share a central axis of rotation. So we won't have to include translational terms as we compute uh, the sum of the moments of inertia. Then in part B, we're going to compute the torque, which is designated by the capital Greek letter tau, as the product of that total moment of inertia that we computed in part A and the angular acceleration, which is denoted by the Greek letter alpha. Now we aren't given angular acceleration, so we're going to need to use a kinematic equation for rotational motion to compute it. As we make our plan, we'll figure out what we should use more specifically. As we develop this problem, we'll start with the picture. We have our frisbee, and we have separated the mass so that half the mass is in the central disc and half is in the rim, which I've exaggerated here for uh, labeling ease. And so we're going to call the disc mass 1 and the mass that's in the rim as mass 2. We're told that the total mass is divided equally between them, so mass 1 equals mass 2 equals half of the total mass, which we were told was 102 grams. So half the mass in each will be equal to 0 0.051 kilograms. Now, the rim is folded over, and we're going to consider that both of these have the same radius, which we'll call capital R. So the radius of mass 1 is equal to the radius of mass 2, which is going to be equal to half the diameter of 21 centimeters. So that gives us 10.5 centimeters, and in MKS units, that's 0 0.105 meters. Now we're told that the final angular velocity, omega, is achieved with an angular displacement of pi over 2 radians, or one quarter term. We're told that the final angular velocity is equal to 530 revolutions per minute. This is, or RPM. This is not an MKS unit, and if we convert it to radians per second, we get 
0.50 radians per second. And so now we need a plan for solving this problem. Part A, step one, is going to be to express that total moment of inertia, I, as the sum of I for mass one, which is the disk, and mass two, which is the ring. And then we will want to uh, substitute values, because we're ready to do that already. And we can go ahead and compute that total moment of inertia, which we will then express to the correct number of significant figures. In part B, we're asked to find the total torque required to reach that final angular velocity. And so our first step is to ex express torque in terms of that total moment of inertia and the angular acceleration. But again, we don't have angular acceleration. So we need to express angular acceleration in terms of that final angular velocity and the angular displacement using a kinematic equation. There are several rotational kinematic equations, and the one that we want is the one that doesn't include time, because we don't have time and we don't want to have to take intermediate steps to compute it. And so what we're going to use is the one without time, and then we will solve symbolically for the angular acceleration, then we can substitute values in step one and compute the torque. And then we'll express that answer also to the correct number of significant figures. Now we're ready to go and evaluate the problem by following our plan. First of all, we will express for part A the total, part A step one, the total moment of inertia is equal to the moments of inertia for mass one and mass two. So that is equal to, for the disk, one half the mass of the disk times the radius of the disk squared. And for the ring, the mass of the ring times the radius of the ring squared. Now, since mass one is equal to mass 2 and the two radii are also equal, we can consolidate these two expressions into 3 halves mass times radius squared. And then we will substitute values, which brings us to step 2, and that is equal to 3 halves times the mass of 0 0.051 kilograms times the radius of 0 0.105 meters squared. And with careful computation, we find then that is equal to 8.436 times 10 to the negative 4, and our units will be kilograms times meters squared. So for the whole frisbee, the moment of inertia reported to two significant figures, which is what we were given in our given values, is 8.4 times 10 to the negative 4 kilograms times meters squared. For part B, we know that the torque is going to be equal to that moment of inertia we just computed times the angular acceleration. But to find the angular acceleration, we've realized that we need to use the kinematic equation for uh, rotational motion that does not involve time, which is the final angular velocity squared equals the initial angular velocity squared plus 2 times the angular acceleration times the angular displacement, which is the final position minus the initial position in radians. Now, initially, the frisbee's at rest before it's tossed, so the initial angular velocity is zero. 
Similarly, we can call the initial angular position zero. And if we then solve for the angular acceleration, we get that the angular acceleration is the final angular velocity squared over 2 times the final angular position, which is equal to 55.5 radians per second quantity squared over 2, and we're told that it reaches that final angular velocity with a quarter turn, which corresponds to pi over 2 radians. And so we find then that the angular acceleration is 980.4749 radians per second squared. Now we're not actually asked for that value, but we need it to compute the torque, which is what we can do next. So the torque is equal to the moment of inertia, which we need to use the non-rounded value to avoid rounding errors. And that's multiplied by the angular acceleration and that gives us a final torque of 0.827 newtons times meters. to two significant digits, that's 0.83 meters. How can we determine whether this answer makes sense? First we want to check our units. And if we go back to the moment of inertia, which is used in both calculations, we find that we have kilograms times meters squared, and so that unit is correct. And here when we substitute values into the torque equation, Kilograms times meters squared times radians per second squared, that's a lot of units, but we need to recall what the definition of a newton is. Kilograms times meters per second squared, and so we end up with newtons times one unit of uh, a single term of meters left over. So those units make sense. But what about the magnitude? Let's translate that torque into how many pounds you, of force you have to put on a disk of this radius. So if we divide the torque by the radius, then we get a force of about 8 newtons, and that translates into about um, 2 pounds of force. And so 105 gram frisbee is a very light frisbee. A competition frisbee is more like 175 grams. And so you can imagine that a two pound force, a flick of the wrist, is not unreasonable for this problem. Now if you'd come up with 50 or 100 pounds, that would have been a red flag that maybe something was wrong with your calculations. But as it is, through checking the units and doing a little bit of gestalt to make sure that the number was within the realm of what seems reasonable, we have confidence that our answer is correct.